Well, hello, and welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm joined by my lifelong friend, who no longer wears the makeup, Chad Cooper. What is Pick 6 Movies, you ask? It's a podcast about movies. What's a podcast, you ask? What are you, 80? Don't you have Google? Sorry, it, it's just that we're under a lot of pressure here at Pick 6 Movies to deliver to you, our listening audience, a quality show fortnightly. The problem is, we tend to pick six movies based around a theme, and all of those movies are generally kind of bad. And this second episode of Season 15 is all about Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. I mean, have you seen this movie? No? That's fine. You don't have to see this movie to enjoy this episode. In fact, I can guarantee your life will be substantially better if you only listen to this episode and skip the movie completely. Now, before we get into our discussion, let's get Chad in here to whip a little knowledge on us and try to explain why this movie happened. May God have mercy on our souls. The formation of every great band begins with the meeting of two people. Paul McCartney first saw John Lennon performing with the band The Quarrymen at St. Peter's Church in Liverpool. McCartney would later join the band The Quarrymen, and that band would later become The Beatles. Farrakh Bassara was studying art and design at the Ealing College of Art when he met Tim Staffel, who asked Balsara to be the lead singer of his band Smile. Balsara would later change his name to Freddie Mercury, and Smile would change their name to the band Queen. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards went to the same school when they were kids, but it was a chance encounter on a train years later that sparked a friendship that led to the Rolling Stones. A local newspaper ad reading, Drummer, looking for other metal musicians to jam with Tigers of Pantang, Diamond Head, and Iron Maiden, led to a phone call where Lars Ulrich picked up the phone and Metallica was formed. Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham met at a party during her senior year at Atherton High School. Cheryl James and Sandra Denton, they met at a college and started working as telephone solicitors at Sears before enlisting the help of their friend Deidre Roper to create one of the most famous hip-hop groups from the 1980s, Salt and Peppa and DJ Spinderella. For every iconic band, there's a story of how that band was formed. And to tell the story of how Gene, Paul, Ace, and Peter came together to form the band KISS, we must begin our journey in Israel, where it all started with the birth of Heimwitz in 1945. Heimwitz was born in Israel to Jewish immigrants from Hungary. His mother, Florence Klein, survived internment in Nazi concentration camps along with her brother. And they were the only two family members who survived the Holocaust. Haim's father, Ferry, was a carpenter and Haim was raised as a practicing Jew. Haim's family was very poor and Haim actually picked wild fruit that he would sell along the roadside to make money to support his family. One bright spot of Haim's early life was that he loved playing music, especially the guitar. Hey, can we change the music here? It's a little bit too much. That's much better. When Haim was eight years old, he and his mother immigrated to the United States and their family made a new home in New York City. His father stayed in Israel due to responsibilities associated with an extended family that included another son and three other daughters. Starting over in the United States was a chance to create a new life and a new identity. Chaim decided that he would change his name to Eugene Klein, adopting his mother's last name. When he was nine years old, he attended a Jewish religious school, but quickly transferred to public schools. Klein finished his primary and secondary studies, and he went on to attend Richmond College and Sullivan County Community College in New York. Klein continued with his studies and took a series of jobs, including working as an assistant editor at the fashion magazine Vogue, and even spent time as a sixth grade teacher teacher. And during these early formative years of adulthood, Klein never let go of his passion for music. And this was driven in part by something that happened in his youth that really changed his life forever. See, Klein saw the Beatles appear on the Ed Sullivan Show, and he realized, look, these are just four guys from England who were just regular people with long hair, kind of like girls' hair. And they made music that made people lose their minds and go absolutely wild. 
Like so many musicians, there comes a point in time in one's life where you have to make a decision regarding your commitment to being a professional musician or not. Klein came to that point in his life and he decided to pursue his passion and he adopted a new stage name based on the rockabilly singer Jumpin' Gene Simmons. Klein dropped the Jumpin' and the rest is rock and roll history. Gene Simmons' very first rock band, like most rock legends, happened during his teenage years. The band was called Lynx, spelled L-Y-N-X. This evolved into Missing Lynx. Um, that group fell apart, as bands often do. He then formed the band The Long Island Sounds. After that came Bullfrog Beer, spelled B-H-E-E-R. That didn't last too long. But then Simmons formed the band Wicked Lester in the early 1970s with a fellow guitar enthusiast named Stanley Eisen. Stanley Eisen was born on January 20th, 1952 in Manhattan to Jewish parents, where he was the second of two kids. He had an older sister. Eisen's mother's family fled Nazi Germany to Amsterdam, and eventually they made their way to New York City. Eisen was raised Jewish-ish. They weren't too observant, and he didn't have a bar mitzvah. But in his home growing up, it was filled with the sounds of opera and classical music. When Eisen was born, his right ear had a birth defect that resulted in the outer ear not being fully formed, which caused him to have no hearing on the right side. And it made it really difficult for him to hear in noisy environments all through his adulthood. Eisen went to public school where, because of this, he was teased by other kids because he was different. Don't worry, Stanley Eisen grows up to be Paul Stanley from the rock and roll supergroup KISS. Eisen loved music, and at an early age, he was given a toy guitar when he was seven. His family eventually moved to Queens in the 60s during the doo-wop and British invasion eras. And when he turned 13 years old, Eisen got a real acoustic guitar, and he began to play hits from Bob Dylan and the Birds. He was a natural artist, and he attended the High School of Music and Arts in New York, where he graduated as a talented graphic artist. Despite his artistic abilities, music remained Eisen's true passion. And much like Eugene Klein, a.k.a. Gene Simmons, Eisen decided to pursue music over everything else. Eisen's passion for music landed him in a band called Rainbow. Then he was a member of a band called Uncle Joe and the Post-War Baby Boom. Then a friend introduced Eisen to Gene Simmons, where he was invited to join the band Wicked Lester. They recorded an album in 1972, but that album was never released. And about this time, Wicked Lester fell apart. Simmons and Stanley remained friends, where they saw an advertisement in the August 31st, 1972 edition of Rolling Stone that read, Experienced rock and roll drummer looking for an original group to do soft and hard rock music. They answered the ad, and here it was, they met Peter John Chris Cuola, or as he is more widely known, Peter Chris. Peter Chris was born in Brooklyn and his family was Italian and he was the oldest of five kids. Much like Simmons and Stanley, Peter Chris was a musician starting in his early childhood. He loved swing music and eventually studied under Gene Krupa. Krupa was a jazz drummer and a band leader with lots of showmanship and high energy. And he was one of the first drummers that showed that drummers weren't just for keeping up the tempo. They were an important voice of every band that deserved to be heard. Chris was part of multiple bands in the 1960s, including Chelsea, that released a self-titled album in 1970. Chelsea eventually evolved into a band called Lips. And when the band Lips fell apart, Peter Chris placed the aforementioned ad in Rolling Stone. Simmons and Stanley and Chris met at a nightclub where Peter Chris was playing drums. But it was after hearing Peter Chris sing that Simmons and Stanley thought Peter Chris was just what they needed to fill out their new band. Chris formally auditioned and he was in. The trio began to collaborate on a more harder form of rock than was being produced by the band Wicked Lester. By January of 1973, things were starting to really come together for this emerging group and there was a need for a lead guitarist. Enter Paul Daniel Freely, or as he was known by his high school friends, Ace. Freely was born and raised in the Bronx. And much like Simmons and Stanley and Chris, Freely's family introduced music into his life and the life of his brother and sister at a very early age. Freely was given his first electric guitar as a Christmas present in 1964 
And that was it. Freely didn't take lessons. He was self-taught and he was influenced by Hendrix and B.B. King and The Who, among many others. Now, Freely was part of a lot of bands as well during his youth, including The Outrage, The Four Roses, a band called King Kong. At one point, he was in a band called Cathedral, where he started getting paid, so he dropped out of school. But then his parents and his girlfriend came in and said, you need to finish your degree. He ended up going back to school and getting his degree, and he held short-term jobs working as a mail carrier. He also delivered furniture, he delivered messages, he delivered liquor. If Hell, if you needed something delivered, Ace was your guy. Freely joined and left multiple bands in the early 70s until a friend saw an ad for a lead guitarist in the Village Voice. Freely answered the ad, went to the live bait bar, where he auditioned for rhythm guitarist Paul Stanley, bass guitarist Gene Simmons, and drummer Peter Chris. Three weeks later, Freely was named as the lead guitarist of the newly formed band KISS. The name of the band was reportedly the brainchild of Paul Stanley, who heard Peter Chris talking about the band he used to be in called Lips. Legend has it that Paul Stanley said, what about a kiss? And the rest is rock and roll history. Ace Freely used his artistic skills to draw the iconic KISS logo with the double lightning bolt S's with a Sharpie marker. The band's name has repeatedly been the subject of rumors pertaining to alleged hidden meanings. There were all sorts of rumors regarding the shape of the S's resembling Nazi symbols, and there was a conspiracy theory that claimed that KISS stood for Knights in Satan Service or Kids in Satan Service, but everyone in the band said that was a bunch of fan fiction or just bullshit from panicked parents. So the band had a name, they had a logo, but they needed a look. So let's talk about the look, the makeup and the costumes, which were both influenced heavily by the glam rock scene of the 1960s. Glam rock emerged in the 60s in the UK and was part of the psychedelic art rock scene. Mark Bolan, who was one of the musical founders of the psychedelic folk band T-Rex, well, Mark Bolan is credited as being the originator of glam rock when he performed on a BBC music program wearing a satin sailor suit and glitter. And it was this performance that introduced the British youth watching this particular television program to a new word, androgyny. Bolin then began to perform regularly wearing these glamorous outfits, including top hats and feather boas, and he always had a drop of glitter on each cheek. This new style of performing wasn't lost on Bolin's friend, David Bowie. More specifically, it wasn't lost on David Bowie's alter ego, Ziggy Stardust. This persona took to wearing makeup and much more feminine styles of clothing when performing. Ziggy Stardust was followed by subsequent glam rock performers such as Roxy Music, Sweet, Slade, and even Alvin Stardust. No familial relation to Ziggy Stardust because these were just made up personas. And that's what performers were doing in the early 70s. They were creating these personas and dressing up in outlandish outfits that created new identities and wild spectacle and something worth talking about. And the members of KISS did all of that. Paul Stanley became known as Starchild. Peter Chris was Catman. Ace Freely, Spaceman. And Gene Simmons, the Demon. The debut of these new personas weren't what we know them to be today when Kiss first took the stage at the Popcorn Club in Queens where they performed for about 10 people and got paid 50 bucks on January 30th, 1973. No, 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 no. It was a solid 10 days later that the world famous platform shoe wearing characters made their debut at the Daisy Club in Amityville, New York, where Paul, Peter, Ace, and Gene injected a shot of machismo into the glam rock style of the early 70s and took the stage as Kiss proper. At the time, there was a growing glitter scene in New York where boys dressed up like girls in makeup and these female wardrobes. But most of these were skinny, hairless young men taking to the stage to perform. The members of KISS couldn't pull this look off as easily because they were well over six feet tall in platform shoes. And in their first attempt to bring these new personas to life, they looked like, as Gene Simmons recalled it, drag queens. The band delivered a look that wasn't blue jeans and t-shirts. They delivered a look that was big, something unique, a look that you would never forget. 
In March, KISS recorded a five-song demo, and they got a band manager by October of 1973, and in November, they were signed to Casablanca Records. A couple of months later, in December, they were opening up for Blue Oyster Cult, where Gene Simmons set his hair on fire as he performed a fire-breathing stunt during the song Firehouse. And that was KISS! From the very beginning, everything the band did was big and loud and aggressive and over the top. KISS started touring in 1974 at the same time their self-titled debut album was released. In February of 74, they appeared on ABC's network music show In Concert, where they performed three songs, Nothing to Lose, Black Diamond, and Firehouse, where Gene Simmons did not set his hair on fire. Then in April, the band appeared on the Mike Douglas talk show, where at the very last minute, producers wanted one of the band members to be interviewed by Mike Douglas. Gene Simmons stepped up and conducted his first televised interview as The Demon. Now, if you don't know the Mike Douglas show, it was a more white bread version of every late night talk show that you see today. I got a new rock group for you, Tony. This is their latest album, which I'm going to show the camera right here. But before we see them perform, I want you to meet one of the members of this act close up. Here from KISS is Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons slunks out onto the stage, wiggling his infamously long tongue in full makeup as the demon with platform boots, tight black leather pants, and almost cartoonish-like skull and crossbones on a black t-shirt. He's also wearing a black cape with a spiked black collar, and the cape attaches to his hands to form bat wings as he extends out his arms. On the stage with Mike Douglas is comedian Robert Klein, as well as TV personality Ben Hunter. At one point, Robert Klein leans in to kiss Gene Simmons and then backs away at the last minute. Hey, can we do a close shot of the shoes, please? Look at these shoes. I mean, let's let, let turn them this way so we can see them. That is something. Incidentally, else. he's up for adoption. <laughs> now, the woman talking here is comedian Toadie Fields, who looks to be Mike Douglas's female equivalent of Johnny Carson's Ed McMahon, where she was providing color commentary during Douglas's interview. I refuse, Tony. Gene, what, what are you? I'm really just a member of KISS. You know? Who dreamed this up, this, this get-up? We all did. How many members? In the there group? are four members. You know, your audience really looks appetizing. Oh, really? Are you a bat? Yes. <laughs> Actually, what I am is evil incarnate. And some of those cheeks and necks look really good. <laughs> When Gene Simmons hisses and extends his tongue at the audience, the camera cuts to Toadie Fields, who just rolls her eyes at the ridiculousness of this situation. Why the costume? Why the costume? For... <laughs> oh my... I can tell he's your type, Tony. I can just tell. <laughs> Is your mother watching today? <laughs> Yes, It'd be funny if under this he was just a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> you should only know. <laughs> Where you I do. You can't hide the hook. <laughs> <laughs> the hook Toadie Fields is referring to is Gene Simmons' stereotypical shaped nose that apparently couldn't hide beneath the layers of white and black face paint. During this appearance on The Mike Douglas Show, KISS performed their hit Firehouse once again without Gene Simmons catching his hair on fire. And following that, the band continued to tour and do more publicity events, but sales of the first album stalled at around 75,000 copies sold. That same year, KISS recorded their second album, Hotter Than Hell, which was released in October, and it didn't really light up the charts. So KISS stopped touring, went back to the studio, and recorded Dress to Kill which came out in March of 1975, almost a year after their debut album. Now, this album did better than their sophomore outing, but more importantly, this was the album that included the group's rock anthem, Rock and Roll All Night. Now, admittedly, the band and their record label felt that the first three albums were not selling as well as Kiss had hoped they would, and everyone felt that the problem was that the studio albums didn't capture the insanity and the over-the-top spectacle of Kiss's live performance. KISS concerts had Gene Simmons breathing fire and spitting blood from his mouth. Ace Frehley's guitar would burst into flames and smoke. Peter Criss 
play drums on a riser that shot sparks into the air. Paul Stanley would smash his guitar a la Pete Townsend. There were pyrotechnics and lights and an oversized illuminated KISS logo as the centerpiece of this hard rock spectacle. KISS had to find a way to put that into an album, but not any ordinary album. It needed to be an album that would reflect the larger-than-life personas that made up KISS. By the middle of 75, their record company, Casablanca, was almost bankrupt. Things were not looking good for KISS keeping their record contract, despite the fact that KISS was regularly selling out live shows. It was decided that KISS would release a double live album to capture the excitement of their live performances. The final product was an album titled Alive, and the rest was rock and roll history. Alive was incredibly successful. The album would go on to reach gold status, it saved their record label, and it propelled KISS into superstar status. Alive peaked at number 9 on the Billboard 200 album charts, and it remained on the Billboard 200 for 110 weeks. Years later, in 2003, Rolling Stone ranked Alive as one of the top 500 albums of all time at 159, and Guitar World magazine ranked it as the number 3 album in their top 10 live albums of all time. And in case you're wondering, number 2 was Frampton Comes Alive, and number one was Johnny Cash at the Folsom County Prison. You cannot argue with that ranking. KISS next decided to work with producer Bob Ezen, who worked with shock rock godfather Alice Cooper. No relation to me. This partnership between KISS and Ezen resulted in the release of the very ambitious and very successful album Destroyer in March of 1976. Production of Destroyer included the use of a full orchestra, a choir, all kinds of audio effects. The cover of the album was designed by Ken Kelly, who'd previously drawn artwork for Tarzan and Conan the Barbarian. The success of Destroyer was driven in part by the release of the single Detroit Rock City because of what was on the B side of that single, a song that got more nationwide airplay than any other Kiss song they'd ever released. The rock ballad Beth, as performed by Peter Criss, featured a piano and an orchestra backing, and it was unlike any other song that Kiss had released to date. It's the only song on Destroyer that doesn't feature any of the other members of Kiss other than, or, you know, Peter Criss singing. And the song Beth started hitting airways in mass, and sales of the album Destroyer took off. The song Beth was so popular that when the album was reissued, they flipped the A-side and B-side so that Beth was now on the A-side. Destroyer topped out at number 7 on the Billboard Top 100, and it went on to be certified platinum by the end of 1976, selling over 1 million copies. Not too bad for a band that was formed four years earlier. In October of 1976, KISS appeared on the Paul Lynn Halloween special, which gave them even more exposure to a wider audience. In November of that year, they released the album Rock and Roll Over, followed by another album, Love Gun, in June of the following year. The success of their live album Alive led to another live album titled Alive 2, which came out in October of 1977. And all three of those releases were certified platinum shortly after their releases. KISS reportedly earned $18 million in music record royalties and music publishing. KISS was named the most popular band in the United States, and they had international appeal as KISS sold out shows in Tokyo. And, and performing overseas wasn't the most unexpected place that you found KISS. May of 1977, KISS landed in their first comic book appearance, showing up in issues number 12 and number 13 of Marvel's Howard the Duck, titled Mind Mush and Rock and Roll Over and Ride, respectively. In these appearances, KISS appeared as themselves. But this comic book appearance led to Marvel publishing a magazine format full-color comic book titled A Marvel Comic Super Spectacular KISS, presenting the band KISS as superheroes where they actually battled Doctor Doom. You know, the guy who normally goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Fantastic Four? The comic book versions of KISS were created when four teenagers were exposed to a strange magical box and they were transformed into these mystical superheroes. And KISS having superpowers on the pages of a comic book wasn't the most unexpected twist in this story, as blood from each band member was drawn by a registered nurse, witnessed by a notary, and then poured into the vats of ink used for printing the comic book. 
<laughs> Kiss went on to appear in numerous other comics, but all of this was just the beginning of their appeal as a marketing powerhouse with their growing Kiss Army fan club, who were eager to purchase lunchboxes and dolls, board games, pinball machines, trading cards, do-it-yourself home makeup kits, Halloween costumes, and later in their career, coffins. Kiss Mania was at an all-time high in 1978, and it was decided that the band would make a shift in their approach to recording albums and their marketing of the band Kiss. Now, this new plan had two steps. Step one was that each member would record a solo album, and these four albums would be released at the same time. Why release just one album when you can release four? These solo albums would showcase the musical styles of each band member and allow for collaborations with other popular musicians of the time, including Joe Perry, Donna Summer, Bob Seger, and Cher, who was dating Gene Simmons at the time. These solo albums were released in September of 1978, and only Ace Frehley's album sold particularly well, driven in part by his cover of New York Groove. And it should be noted that Gene Simmons' album included a cover of When You Wish Upon a Star from the Disney film Pinocchio. Now, the second step of this new approach to Kiss's entertainment empire included Kiss appearing in their very own motion picture, Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. Kiss's creative manager, Bill Aukoin, was the one who decided to tap into the superhero comic book personas for Kiss's feature film debut. Screenwriters Jam Michael Sherman and Don Bunday were brought in to usher Kiss into the world of feature films. Sherman and Bunday had almost no screenwriting experience between them. Um, they'd shared a writing credit on just one movie prior. It was a sexy adventure film with a hit lady called Too Hot to Handle. And the movie itself was originally conceived as a mashup of Star Wars and A Hard Day's Night and loosely based on Phantom of the Opera. All that sounds like a terrible idea. And to make the movie, filmmakers had a budget of about two million bucks. For reference, the original Star Wars had a budget of $11 million, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind had a budget of $20 million. So we're not talking about a whole lot of money here. Now, who could make a Kiss movie on such a small budget? Well, the talented creative types over at Hanna-Barbera. You know, the company behind the Flintstones, and Yogi Bear, and Scooby-Doo, and Speed Buggy, and Hong Kong Fooey. The writers spent, oh my god, the writers spent some time with each band member to get a feel for who they were as people. These meetings resulted in a draft script where Ace Freely only said, Ugh, as a proto build the cat, as Ace proved to be somewhat dismissive in his one on one meetings with the screenwriters who leaned into his abrupt replies. Ace was envisioned as an intergalactic Harpo Marx. Ace read the script, Ace complained, and Ace got a few more lines. To direct the film, German-born British director Gordon Hessler was brought in. Hessler had experience working with Alfred Hitchcock, oh my god, and he'd also directed three Vincent Price movies including Scream and Scream Again, which featured Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. Now apparently during filming, Hester was regularly confused as to why he was asked to helm this motion picture, and reportedly he referred to the stars of the film as The Kiss. The movie was primarily filmed at the Magic Mountain theme park in California, and cameras started rolling in May of 1978, and it would just be five months later that the film aired on NBC in October. To say that the movie was rushed and slapped together is a bit of an understatement. People watching the movie at home, most of whom were kids, a growing demographic of the KISS Army, well, this audience did get to hear Paul Stanley's New York accent for the first time, but as for hearing the voices of the other members of Kiss? That didn't happen. Gene Simmons' lines were filtered through a bunch of reverb to make him sound more demonic. Ace Freely, despite his request for more lines, mostly was stuck with the ack-ack routine. And Peter Chris, well, his voice was dubbed in post-production by voice actor Michael Bell, best known for his work as Grouchy, Handy, and Lazy Smurf. He was also Duke on G.I. Joe. Now, one of the reasons you don't hear much of the band speak is because they were terrible actors. Another problem was that due to the excessive downtime on the set, they were allegedly loaded during the filming of the movie. Ace Frehley's lack of dialogue and reported heavy drinking led to him just leaving the set during the filming of the fight sequence in the Chamber of Horrors. His stunt double, who was a black man, stepped in to film the big action sequence. 
director Gordon Hessler either didn't notice or didn't care or both. And in the movie, you can actually see that the spaceman is actually a space black man fighting robotic monsters. Peter Chris was reportedly not happy with the final movie, saying, I can't see John Lennon getting beat up by Dracula, and I can't see Mick Jagger wrestling with Frankenstein. Although, now that I hear that, I kind of want to see both of those things. When Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park hit the small screens in America, look, nobody knew how bad it was going to be. The Kiss Army was huge. Kiss was huge. And the movie's ratings made it the second biggest TV movie of the year, behind Shogun. Kiss hoped that this movie would be the first in a series, like the James Bond films, but that clearly didn't happen. And this was the one and only movie that the band Kiss ever made. But that didn't stop the members of Kiss from taking some acting lessons and showing up later in other films and TV shows. Gene Simmons starred as the bad guy in the Tom Selleck sci-fi movie Runaway. Ace Frehley appeared in the 2005 indie film Remedy. Peter Chris was on an episode of the HBO prison drama series Oz. And Paul Stanley went on to star in a Broadway production of The Phantom of the Opera, which did not include any elements of Star Wars or A Hard Day's Night. The band did team up with the Hanna-Barbera production company much later in their career as they solved crimes with Mystery Incorporated in 2015's Scooby-Doo and Kiss Rock and Roll Mystery. And I'm pretty sure that is a much better piece of entertainment than the movie we're about to discuss. So what happened to Kiss after Phantom of the Park? They released more albums, they toured, there were drugs, there was alcohol, resentment, the band breaks up, the band gets back together, they took off the makeup for a while, they put it back on because that's what the fans want to see. In 2013, KISS was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and they kept touring because the KISS Army still loves them and KISS loves performing for them. Most recently, KISS appeared on the NBC talent show America's Got Talent in February of 2020 where they performed Rock and Roll All Night and it was announced prior to that on a kiss cruise in november of 2019 oh my god can you imagine a kiss cruise what that would be like (laughs) sorry (laughs) on this cruise the band announced that the last show of their current tour would be on july 17th 2021 and then covid19 happened and everything in the world went to shit and so the final chapter of the kiss legacy remains unwritten will kiss keep performing i'm sure they will Will KISS ever make another movie? I'm sure they will not. And if they do, we'll discuss it on this very podcast. So without any further delay, demons, spacemen and space women, cat men and cat women, and star childs of all ages, slap on your face paint, lace up those platform boots, and get ready to rock and roll all night and every day. As Pick 6 Movies proudly presents you... The 1978 made-for-TV cult classic motion picture, Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I am Chad Cooper and joined by my lifelong star child, ace in the hole, demon at night, cat mantastic, partner in crime, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? I was hoping for a, a cat man crothers perhaps, but I get it. I'm doing great because now that we're doing this show, I can put this movie on a shelf and, and never, never look at it again. It again. <laughs> Yes, let this thing collect dust and be a point of shame when finally they clean out the house after I'm found dead in the basement. I've asked this before, but I have to ask it again. Is this the worst movie we've ever reviewed? I mean, it's barely a movie. Is it the cheapest movie we've ever reviewed? Maybe it looks cheap. Does it have less production quality than Kingdom of the Spiders? Yes. Then it's the cheapest movie we've ever reviewed. That has a whole crowd scene in the town with parades. and. There was a concert in this movie? They filmed a concert? Yes, because it was like, hey, we're going to put Kiss on stage at Magic (laughs) Mountain. Do you guys want to come watch Kiss? Sure. It's the 70s. Lots of people are making bad decisions. Nobody was showing up to watch Captain Kirk run around 
some downtown with a bunch of cobwebs strapped to his back. That's because you were paying people to make that happen. That's production value, Chad. Not just turning a camera on a concert you were going to have anyway. Were you a fan of Kiss? Are you a fan of Kiss? No. <laughs> I think much like the Law of Averages, they've got a couple of songs that are kind of fine. Uh-huh. But I mostly find the band a little cynical. Look, I'm much more of a, you know, a Tom Waits kind of kind of fan <laughs> as opposed to Kiss. I want my singers to be gin-soaked and talking about how the prostitute won't actually love them the way that they love her. That's my kind of music, not, hey, isn't everything great and let's party. That's not the music I listen to. Nobody in the history of ever has said, you can only choose one, Tom Waits or Kiss. Right, but I feel like <laughs> at a certain point, if you are enough of a Tom Waits fan, Kiss just moves out of that Venn diagram. Like, it gets <laughs> it gets pushed out by your Freedy Johnstons, perhaps. My brother had a Kiss-themed birthday cake when he was, like, around 11. There's photographic evidence of that. I've seen these pictures, and I remember those pictures. <laughs> and my mother, who you know was a public high school teacher, once dressed up along with three other teachers and they performed his kiss in a teacher talent show and were allowed to continue it was a different time it was like you could do that and still teach after <laughs> I had an older cousin of mine that had a lot of Kiss posters up in his room, and he had all four of those solo albums. And I remember the brother who had the Kiss birthday party, he had copies of Dress to Kill and Destroyer in his bedroom amongst his music collection. I also remember that that brother and some of his friends once showed me a centerfold in some porn rag with a fully nude transvestite, and that was a real education for me around age eight or nine. Yeah, that, that'll make you question a few things. Let me turn the question on you, though. Were, were you a Kiss fan? I don't recall you being a fan of, of the Kiss. No, I was not a fan of Kiss. I never dressed up like any of the members of Kiss. It was kind of in the rearview mirror of when we grew up. We were more during the time where there was this resurgence of classic rock that happened in the late 80s and into the 90s in parallel with a lot of hair bands that were clearly influenced by Kiss as far as dressing up in a more androgynous fashion. But I was not a huge Kiss fan. I watched this movie on TV when it debuted. I vividly remember that. And I also remember as a kid watching it thinking, is it possible for a chick to have a dick? No, no, no. Anyway, as I'm looking at the movie, the scene where they sit in the lifeguard chairs, again, even as a child, I cocked my head and was like, what are they doing? The moment for me is as soon as you hear, uh, like... Wait a second, Star Child. <laughs> That's the point I was like, oh no. Record scratch? Yeah, you can. I'll tell you what, I'm just going to close this and you can have that back and I bid you a fond adieu. This movie was released on October 28th, 1978, which means it had to be marketed as a Halloween movie. Because five days later, Alice Cooper appeared on The Muppet Show, where he performed Welcome to My Nightmare, dressed up as Dracula. And he also performed the gentle rock ballad you and me yeah. with this green bird monster that turns out to be miss piggy under a spell or something uh-huh you and me ain't no superstars <laughs> what we are is what we are the 70s was a weird time man we share a bed some loving and TV. <laughs> the evidence of the weirdness of the 70s is Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park. So our movie starts off and we see a spinning cover of the aforementioned Kiss album Rock and Roll Over coming at you like an Adam West Batman logo interstitial. <laughs> <laughs> the title of the movie appears on the screen. Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park. And it's in this font that can only be described as 1978 Snow Day School Closing Announcement font. <laughs> I know you mentioned the name of the director. I can't remember his name now. Yeah, it's Carl Hansen. Yeah, him. Uh, Carl Hansen is a real feed up kind of director for sure in this movie. <laughs> right from the opening credit sequence, you know you're in for a cheap time. But the movie doesn't waste any time giving the audience what it wants to see because one by one, Kiss appears in all their glory playing their iconic rock anthem, Rock and Roll All Night. And dude, for a brief moment, you might think, hey, this might be pretty good until you notice that Gene Simmons is standing in front of, it's like, it's maybe a rear projection 
projection or early version of green screen. And it's Gene Simmons and he's in front of this footage of a theme park at night and there's a faint outline of a white roller coaster behind him and fireworks start exploding out of the side of his head. It's like giant size, like kaiju sized kiss, plain music in the theme park but kind of ghostly and for a while i was like oh okay well they're just superimposing footage of the band playing stuff but there's a point in the opening credits where some girls are kind of grooving by Uh uh-huh and look up as if to say like hey is that a ghostly giant gene simmons playing bass up there and that's the (laughs) point where you're like what the fuck is this movie yeah because the roller coaster track is a good 12 stories tall easily yes and then from behind it appears a 15 story tall gene simmons like he's godzilla which in this movie you're like godzilla and gene simmons they both breathe fire they both have oversized tongues the fact that gene simmons is this tall is not that unusual a thing you're like oh that may be what happens in the movie but it doesn't really continue in fact i was thinking that maybe he had the same superpowers as as Apache Chief from the Super Friends because Hanna-Barbera made that animated series and stuck him in to diversify up the group of white superheroes. Ironically now, the least likely superhero to ever happen on film or television ever again, Apache Chief. They added in Black Vulcan and Rima the Jungle Girl, El Dorado, and someone named Samurai. Right. All characters that you can't, like, you could barely get away with Katana in was, Suicide Squad. Was Black Vulcan from Star Trek? No. He was, right, he was from the, the wrong side of the tracks on Vulcan. Is that what you're suggesting? I'm not suggesting anything. The other thing that they mix in with all these ghostly Kiss performing is every now and again, you'll see members of Kiss in the car of a, a an amusement park ride. Yeah, flying around. It's fun. Superimposed over images of that same ride actually running Uh uh-huh but clearly the car they're in is not attached and like you said sometimes they're just flying through the park all willy-nilly yeah they're just going through the air like some sid and marty croft production it's actually quite embarrassing it looks like garbage and then thankfully they just walk out of the movie for about half an hour yeah after standing atop a decorative fountain that's blasting water up in the air and then they tiptoe down steps like they're a bunch of girls headed off to prom in high heels for the first time yeah because they're wearing platform boots everybody watch your step (laughs) walking on fountains meaning slippery footing everyone don't fall everyone we don't need to have any sort of accident on the first day of shooting we cut to let's call it the next day or the actual start of our movie Uh and we're in the middle of magic mountain the amusement park in california and a parade is happening and there's a marching band going down the streets and we see a roller coaster zip around the track and there's lots of people from the 70s wandering around this theme park with clothes and fashion that reflects the era and there's not a whole lot of fatsos because high fructose corn syrup and chemicals and food hadn't shown up to make most of america great big fat lards like they are now right like even the ugly people are kind of attractive it, it's a <laughs> weird time i also like that we get a little adrpa <laughs> yeah tonight's movie is kiss meets the phantom of the park also kiss will be performing later tonight for three great nights kiss live Kiss the band. I don't know why the uh, PA is helmed by apparently David Lynch. You there, Janet. Janet Clybaum. You should write this down. You always forget everything. Kiss tonight at 8 p.m. out in the parking lot. Janet, don't forget. Come tonight <laughs> to see Kiss. The band Kiss. It'll open up your mind to different possibilities. It's a real Blue Rose concert. <laughs> In the middle of this park, there are 10 young adults making a pyramid while each of them are on all fours and they're stacked up like they're a bunch of untalented cheerleaders. And then here we meet the theme park's owner, maybe? His name is Calvin Richards, and he comes over with a bunch of security guards and he says, Look at these kids. They're reflecting the spirit of the puck. Irresponsible and reckless while putting others in harm's way. Hey, and remember, nameless security guards, we got super group rock and roll sensation Kiss in concert for three days 
Choice only. These live concerts will put this theme park on the map once and for all. You know, these kids over here make it a human pyramid? They're part of a group that's called the Kiss Army. I like when he points out they called themselves the Kiss Army, Sneed. Who is the, the chief of security? If anyone's interested in being part of the Kiss Army, they should send a self addressed stamp to the following address. <clears throat> I shall wait in case anyone wants to get a piece of paper and a pencil. It's going to go to P.O. Box 44782, Peoria, Illinois, 90487, care of Kiss Army. And then I guess we kind of meet our heroine and her boyfriend, Sam. With a full ride-through video of these two (laughs) idiots on a roller coaster? Yeah, I mean, we're milking this park for all the production value we can, and we watch the whole fucking roller coaster. like From up the hill, down the hill, loop-de-loop, around the corner, through the tunnel? They kiss while they're on there that's the worst place to make out on a violently thrashing ride vehicle of a roller coaster that passed safety inspection earlier in the day thanks to my good friend mr benjamin franklin (laughs) yeah like you just need to carry a baggie of milk with you to drop the teeth in that you're gonna (laughs) knock out trying that little maneuver we cut back to the marching band and they're going down the street and melissa's there with her boyfriend sam and she says do you have to go back to work and sam says yeah there's something i don't understand i'll be back in an hour and so they kiss again and melissa says i love you sam and then sam goes off to solve the mysteries of the universe and i don't think sam reciprocates melissa's love in the same way he just seems a little distant in this performance well i mean part of it is because he gets androided later but also even here it looks like he's got a leg out the door let me just i i I will only bring this up this time i doubt that but go on this scene is the most egregious example of just how often they just age are some bullshit on top of the seed where it's just like hey like uh, the, what, what you're talking about of him like being well, hey i really think there's something going on totally not captured in the moment this was the lips don't match it might as well be like a chop sake movie from hong kong it's the <laughs> level of inattention to detail in this movie of people not giving a shit from the first frame to the last that's really impressive let me also say right now for loyal listeners or first time time visitors welcome but what we're about to describe is a movie that's going to sound incredibly entertaining and it is not this is one of the most boring movies that we've ever reviewed on this podcast yeah but it's going to sound really good but trust me it's not we get some kiss thugs who show up it's slime chopper and a girl whose name i never called her name is dirty d dun dirt cheap Dirty D. D and you're done. <laughs> they, they all look like they're about 45 years old. They're dressed up like these comical stereotypes of a G rated biker gang. They got, or a G rated biker gang. They've got leather caps and denim vests. And I'm sure there are tattoos on the forearm that say mother. There's an errant toothpick for the picking of teeth. They're the kind of gang that shows up to harass Lenny and Squiggy in front of the girls, you know? But surprisingly, they're very polite because in this scene, Chopper, the leader of the gang, he says hey yo let's cut in line so they cut in line of a like a ride or a ice cream stand or something and then these two boys that look like they're nine years old they're wearing face paint of their favorite kiss characters and one of them has a yellow balloon that says kiss on it which really kiss a balloon anything for a buck guys (laughs) non-discriminatory there is an open license agreement it's a minimum payment that's all you gotta meet our three roughnecks cut in line and then a couple of just normal adults are like uh hey man you you can't cut the line oh yeah well sorry about that (laughs) they just leave hey oh look at mr penny polite over here enforcing the rules well i guess we better do what he says and then they do (laughs) as they walk away chopper politely sexually harasses a young woman he's like whoa i think i'm in love (laughs) i'm like well he's the romantic of the bunch yeah hey you're just my type the owner of the place calvin shows up to be like hey all you punks better get out of here 
up yours, old man. As they're walking in, park owner Calvin Richards, he goes by this pyramid of young adults that are stacked up and he says, this place is packed. It's all because of that concert tonight at 8 p.m. featuring super rock and roll band Kiss. And then his entourage of security guards, they all wander off. And then the camera pans over to this cardboard cutout of Kiss up on a platform promoting the concert tonight at 8 p.m. If you haven't heard, Bo. And then our movie's villain shows up and his name is Abner Devereaux. Is he a doctor? He seems like he should have a doctor attached to the front of his name. Right. But I think that would be more of a nickname or an honorary in this. He's Doc, you know, more than a doctor. More importantly is the fact that he's played by Anthony Zerby, who, Bo, we uh-huh. last saw in Pick 6 Movies, getting his head exploded by a pressurized tank in James Bond. Season 13, Episode 4, License to Kill, which was the worst or the best James Bond movie we reviewed from that season, depending upon who you ask. It was my favorite because what? of the alligators and sharks. I hated it because of the cocaine and the head exploding. Well, that head exploding is pretty good. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he shows up and he sees the display and he's just like and so calvin (laughs) you have decided to remove my display oh yeah sorry about that yeah yeah we had to promote the kiss concert over here you understand oh understand I demand to know who took down my Freddy the Fox and Eddie the Owl exhibit to put up that, that, that kiss promotion. It's grotesque. You know, kiss is big. The kids love kiss. We're just giving them what they want, huh? As these two walk through the park, there's another animatronic display. And on the front, it says Kabuki performance. But up on the platform are these two samurai warriors. And Kabuki is like a form of traditional Japanese drama with yeah. you know song and mime and dance. And it's mostly male actors etc etc but in this case it's not kabuki at all it's just two robotic asian guys with swords and by robotic asian guys i mean a couple of mostly out of work actors and they're just up there kind of bending at the waist and popping back up and tilting to the left and back to the right it's the group on mime class equivalent where it's like (laughs) look you're not signed up for the whole course but we're gonna give you an afternoon oh look you're doing samurai good job good job that that looks kind of like a robot i didn't mention this in the introduction at all but really the plot of this movie is a huge ripoff of westworld which came out in 73 and its sequel future world which came out in 76 and there was also the hbo series westworld that really involved a lot more scenes of people having sex with robots and then those mm-hmm. robots kill all the people it's interesting to see how they tease out those kernels of creative inspiration and then wrap them with shit to flush down the toilet yeah, yeah it's like what if we made westworld with kiss only way way worse than that sounds so this dude sam is sneaking around the lab right melissa's would-be boyfriend who is also like i gotta get away from her she is getting crazy i think maybe she's getting a little baby crazy if you know what i mean Mm -hmm. then he finds a secret door in this lab yes he steps inside and we hear a scream and then the door opens up and he's gone like it's a magician's cabinet or something right and then we see a control panel that seems to observe with closed camera televisions uh seems to observe the park and maybe controls the park a little bit i don't know and it's real unclear exactly what this console does entirely none of this makes any sense and then there's just some more random footage of theme park rides for a little bit until we land on melissa hanging out at one of the theme park's finer outdoor eateries as kiss's song christine 16 plays in the background are you familiar with that song bo christine 16 you like that one i'm not familiar with it i I think i understand where it's going my favorite lyrics from that song are she's been around but she's young and clean i gotta have her can't live without her christine 16 huh they should just play that one at the end to make everybody mad and crazy (laughs) melissa's sitting and she's drinking a coca-cola and she's waiting for her true love sam to show up and she gets up and she just ends up wandering through the park that is now full of a few more grown men who are dressed up as members of the band kiss but only with the face paint so it looks actually more like a collection of mimes and because she's hunting for her boyfriend she's just going from person to person being like sam sam 
grabbing him and turning him around and like, oh, no, I'm not Sam. Are you Sam? No. Are you Sam? Clearly not. She does make her way past a Kiss merchandise booth in the park where they're selling shirts and belt buckles. <laughs> Bo, the only time I've ever bought a belt buckle was when it was attached to a belt. Yeah, we're not belt buckle people. I, I think you and I. <laughs> I feel like you need to be either in a band or you need to work the land to have a, a special belt buckle, like a, like a rodeo star or something. Right. Like a real man. Melissa wanders off looking real panicked because her fellow Sam hasn't returned from his work within the promised one hour window. Melissa wanders around and we see similar promotional exhibits for the Kabuki Samurai show that we saw earlier, but this time it's for Spaceland. See tomorrow, today. And those actors who we saw dressed up in samurai outfits earlier, well, now they're dressed up as spacemen and they're doing their best Domo Origato Mr. Roboto routine. Devereaux is complaining, by the way. Explain to me, Calvin, why must I beg for R&D money on my hands and my knees while you invite these musical barbarians into my home? Nay! My cathedral! Look up in the air, Calvin. That airplane pulling a banner promoting tonight's vulgarities. How much did that cost, Calvin? That's money I could have used to create more robots. Hey, look, I got people to answer to here, Abner. I can't be spending money on your little puppets. We gotta get the kids in here with the kiss bands. I know, Calvin, I know. I'm just so close to a breakthrough. I'm this close to having a working prototype of a robot that not only you can have sex with, but Calvin, it will have sex with you. Do you understand what I'm saying, Calvin? The robot will be the dominant one in the bedroom relationship. Me, hey, now you're talking. That I can sell. <laughs> but until you get that figured out, all the rights in this place keep breaking down. I can only pay off my contacts at OSHA <laughs> for so long. Yeah, immediately, Devereaux, when he gets accused of like, hey, you're kind of letting this place fall apart, he's like, but of course I am. Every ride goes through a little bit of that, but I can't explain that to you, a bookkeeper. Well, look, I appreciate the fact that you call me the bookkeeper in this little uh, scenario, but uh, for what it's worth, over in yesterday land, uh, there's a clogged up toilet full of something special. Could you grab a plunger and maybe give it a couple of pumps? Thanks a lot there, Devereaux. I'm a scientist! I don't know how plumbing science works, but I got a feeling that you do. You get that big brain of yours and uh, and all of them fancy words that you use. So, Devereaux, look, you're on the case, all right? Robots and toilet plunging. That's what I rely on you for, okay? And then, so he's off to unplunge. We cut over to our 50s doo-wop thugs, and they're <laughs> fucking with this, in quotes, animatronic gorilla. Yeah. Devereaux wanders by on his way to unclog the toilet and he's like what are you doing to that that simon he is very delicate you ruffians listen carefully from that platform you may damage my marriage of art science beauty and love hey we're just looking for a little fun you know also this thing kind of sucks by the way not wrong if someone told you it was the pinnacle of science or whatever you'd be like this oh all right slime says to him hey yo what's the matter pops you and manila gorilla over here got something going on Let's just call it what it is. Westworld and Ex Machina and part of that first Austin Powers movie clearly show that there is a market for robots that people can have sex with. Yes. And you know, right now, there is someone at this very moment that probably has an advanced engineering degree that's trying to forge together a fleshlight, a homemade real doll using the never approved second generation Teddy Ruxpin utility patents. It's only a matter of time, Bo. Yeah, hard to find on eBay, but come on. <laughs> Especially that model there. Devereaux ignores Slime's kissy, kissy robot sex innuendos. And he says, this robot cost $30,000 and it took over a year to perfect. And Chopper, the leader of the gang, he says, yo, you call that perfection? And this gorilla, it looks like shit. It looks like the kind of thing you would see hanging out in front of a joke and novelty shop. Right. Like I said, if this is the pinnacle of perfection, then what have you been doing with your life? You are a failure at that point. If this is as good as your work ever got, how embarrassing for you. But it's not. We're about to see some insane robots here in a few minutes. Right. Chopper says, look, old timer, we make our own fun, which is why we paid money to experience this low-rent amusement park. 
You want fun? Perhaps you should experience our Chamber of Thrills. It's quite fantastic. Here are some free passes. What were your names again? Chopper, Slime, and Deandra? Slime goes on to say, You get it, Chopper? Chamber of Thrills. I mean, high-tech time all the way. Slime may be one of those people who constantly feels the need to contribute to a conversation, even though he has nothing to say. He's got a real middle management kind of vibe to him. That's what I was going to say, JR. Exactly. It's got that one thing he's got to say in every meeting to make sure everyone recognizes that he's still there and trying to contribute. How do you think he got the name Slime? Do you think it was something that he produced or something that he ate? He came in his pants. I, I don't think there's any question about that. Do you remember on the Cosby show when Theo's best friend was Cockroach? And then over on Growing Pains, Mike Seaver's best friend was named Boner? Yeah. Wasn't Boner played by Leonardo DiCaprio? Who was that? Nah, he was their cousin. Boner was some other guy. I always assumed that Cockroach was selling drugs and the latter was a chronic masturbator. I always assume that any teenager in any show is either fresh off of or about to engage in masturbation. The guy who played Boner became an environmentalist, and he later in life hung himself out in the woods. Oh, shit. Yeah, didn't expect that to happen. You would expect with a name like Boner, everything would have come up his way. I don't know, he was well hung. Well, was he? Maybe that's (laughs) the thing. Maybe, Maybe, ironically, the actor who played Boner was in fact afflicted with a very small penis, and then even though he had this high degree of fame because of the show every time he met ladies who were like oh you play boner oh let's see what's going on and then he would he would forever disappoint them that created this psychological snowball of depression and self-loathing that you know like that's why he threw him himself into environmentalism because you know hey my life has to mean something i'm never going to be able to please a woman or have a family sorry sometimes i invent my own fiction for i don't know just about everything i just like to let you go until you run out of gas it was very entertaining thanks by the way if anyone's listening to this please don't sue us for what <laughs> what would they sue us for the the fictional account of the life and times of boner from growing pains look you can buy the ebook it's gonna be good it's sad but it's good new on abc plus the fictional comings and goings of boner boner's final days we're we're doing a limited series about the the final days of boner if you told me that abc plus was gonna put out a series that was like a rosencrantz and guildenstern version of the life of boner intercut with old footage of growing pains i'd watch that and i don't watch anything except the stupid shit we talk about i wouldn't watch it but i would love to talk to someone who had that's as close as i want to get to it directly if he had a micro penis and the name boner was ironic and like his dad was a a crack addict his mom was just a mess emotionally it was just a heavy drama the mother like shuttles him into the audition where she's like when we got this script from our agent for our little guy here and we saw that the character's name was boner we all cackled this kid's got the smallest prick you ever saw wait so you want this show to be about the actor who played boner of course oh well you're taking it to a whole new level yeah i'm doing the prestige drama chad (laughs) (laughs) i mean you get a brian cranston to play an older boner I am the one who bones. So our aging gang of bikers. Oh, right. They take their free tickets to the Chamber of Thrills and off they go. We cut to a bunch of theme park attendees who are all children and they're on stage with their faces painted as their favorite Kiss band members at what appears to be a lookalike contest. None of them are wearing costumes. One girl is dressed as Peter Chris, the cat man, and she does have a t-shirt with a kitty cat on it. So she's trying. I will also like the fact that the guy who is judging this contest that seems to have no rules or order to it looks a little like peter benchley from jaws you know saying like there's a shadow in the shape of a killer shark here at magic mountain (laughs) 
<laughs> the camera pans over and we see Melissa, our frantic girlfriend of the missing boyfriend, Sam. She is just exclaiming to park security. You gotta know him. He works with someone named Abda Devereaux. And one of the guards says, oh yeah, Devereaux. Every time I see him, he's always got somebody new working for him. His workshop is underground, way underground. It's beneath the sky tower. This is maybe the biggest star of the movie in this, uh, aside from Anthony Zervi. And Kiss. No, I would argue Brian James is more famous than Kiss in the world of acting. But he's, you know, very famously, he's uh, the replicant from Blade Runner. He's been in everything. Brian James is an incredibly prolific actor, was. I think he's passed away. If you need a creepy, weird douchebag, that's your guy. The thing I remember him best from is an episode of Amazing Stories, the Steven Spielberg produced television anthology series. Uh Uh-huh. Does he play a creepy weirdo in that episode? Uh, He he replays a redneck weirdo. (laughs) The episode was called Mummy Daddy, and it was all about a guy making a mummy movie who was playing the mummy when his wife goes into labor, and he tries to get to the hospital to reach her and forgets to get out of mummy makeup and then befalls a group of, like a, a town full of rednecks who think that a legendary mummy in their local history has come back to life. And they are determined to hang or burn him before he can get to the hospital to his wife. It is still a fantastic piece of entertainment. Also, when Brian James and this other security cop, after Melissa is like, hey, have you seen my boyfriend? And they're like... No, we ain't seen that asshole. At one point, one of them goes, boy, for a second, I thought we had another person missing. Implying, Chad, Uh that there has been, let's say, a glut of recent disappearing guests at this theme park. They're security guards. They're not detectives. Don't you think that that's worth filing some paperwork or something? That seems like exactly the kind of thing that security at a theme park would want to get on top of. You would think, but not at this theme park apparently not they're like whoo that was almost work (laughs) Uh, hey how do you know he just didn't go home let's just say that happened give me that paperwork (laughs) went home done listen lady you ever hear a spontaneous combustion how are we gonna find a guy if he disappeared in flame and ash Look, I'm not really supposed to talk about this, but there are trapdoors all over this fucking place. I think one of them goes through the earth. It's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but real. You get sucked into a tube, into an incinerator, shot into space. There's all kinds of crazy shit happening at this theme park. By the way, did you hear Kiss is playing tonight at 8 p.m.? Get there early because there's no seats. Also, at least half the audience is probably going to be sucked through trapdoors. So avoid section H, wink. Wink. We cut to the last thing you ever want to see or hear at a cut rate theme park. A teenage employee at the controls of a ride that is spinning wildly out of control, screaming, I can't stop it! It's out of control! <laughs> this thing's gotten out of hand! These people are gonna die! And so we see the thugs coming out of like the equipment room of this ride or whatever. Are we to believe that these bikers were responsible for the malfunctioning of this theme park ride? Absolutely, absolutely. They slip out just in time for Devereaux to see them. Like, he sees them leaving. You there! Stop! Don't run away from me! But before he can, you know, chase after them dramatically, the owner, Calvin, shows up and is like, Hey, what are you doing to me over here? I got... Customers complain about being thrown right out of the rides. Well, you see, there, there were these rapscallions. Oh, oh, Calvin, I can't lie to you. I was experimenting with some new hydraulic, supersonic, highly illegal motors to increase the ride's speed and capacity to thrill, excite, and amaze our park attendees. Hey, you're ex- experimenting on our customers like some kind of guinea pigs? I don't think this is gonna fly, Abner. It's exactly what I was doing. I'm a scientist. I experiment both outside of the bedroom and in the bedroom, with and without robots around. It's what I do. Yeah, I know about the robots, Abner. Look, I'm gonna need to see you in my office later. You might want to bring a box or two. Look, Calvin, don't be cross. Don't walk away. Calvin, stay. Let's make amends. 
I need your emotional approval, Calvin! Call my secretary! I've disappointed you, haven't I? Look, I I know now's not a good time to let you know this, but I didn't go unclog those facilities you mentioned earlier. Calvin! I'm too far away. Would you like free passes to the Chamber of Thrills? It's all I can offer you, Calvin! I'm seeing Kiss tonight at 8. Calvin, wait! I could put one of these new motors on your golf court. You can get back in half the time, Calvin! I'll call you later. God, Abner Devereaux, you've done it again, you lunkhead. So, he retires to his lab, where he's working on, like, a robot arm or something. They try to pass off that this is a robot arm where he's poking on a control panel, but it's just some guy's arm. This is all just <laughs> shit we got at Radio Shack and glued on a dude. He's poking this arm with a little metal stick and the fingers are like... Eh, eh. It's a real Empire Strikes Back, Luke with the hand kind of business. <laughs> Except way worse than that, of course. And, and so Melissa shows up. Eh, hello? Is there anybody inside? I'm looking for my boyfriend, Sam. Your boyfriend? Why, I haven't seen Sam, but come down. Take the wonka beta. So she, she gets in this elevator and zips down. When she gets off, he's like, well, you've just traveled down 150 feet in only two seconds. Or as we like to call it, one Gene Simmons below the surface of the earth. Oh, really? How come I, I don't have the bends or something? Because of science and the way I designed it. I've designed my elevator to ignore the rules of the flesh. This whole movie feels like an episode of Scooby-Doo. All the beats of the plot. We're in an amusement park. We got a mysterious park owner. We got a weird guy who runs the technology. We got a missing boyfriend. It all feels like a Hanna-Barbera mystery cartoon. The closest analogy I have to this is, I believe it was a two-part episode of The Bionic Woman in which okay. members of the team were being replaced by robots only that had way better special effects <laughs> and was more compelling Lindsay wagner what can't she do you know she's my type <laughs> we come back to the lair and melissa says yeah look Devereaux, we were supposed to meet up later for the kiss concert tonight at 8 p.m i heard kiss was gonna be in this movie because it had the name in the title but i'm not sure that they're gonna show up either just like my no good so-and-so boyfriend sam i have the perfect rejoinder for that check out this barbershop quartet of robots he walks over and first we just see a head sitting on the counter aka a dude under a table with that part of it cut out yes it looks like zombie in peewee's playhouse <laughs> Dang, except that had more effects work going on that was you had swirling colors and it was fun mecca like a high mecca hiney no chad that's what i say to this Devereaux says would you like to see this out of work actor pretending to be a robot speak as though he's just a head not connected to a body hidden beneath the table and melissa says look did sam say anything about quitting his job and by the way did he happen to smell like charlie perfume or love baby soft because if he smelled like charlie i swear to god i'm gonna end up in jail and i'm gonna stab sheila later let me think about that you know the Sam I know has a wandering eye. He's quite the cocksmith. He brings all of his young paramours down here for a little bit of afternoon delight. He's nothing like a boner from growing pains. He has a macro penis from what I can see in his pants. <laughs> he says, I'm sure he'll show up somewhere. Now, goodbye, goodbye. I have things to do. I just want to point out, we're about 30 minutes into this movie already. And the first time we hear any group of four people sing, it's a robot barbershop quartet. Kiss has not been in this movie at all. Not since we saw their ghosts, their giant sized ghosts uh, roaming the park at the beginning. Right, and flying around in yellow bumper cars or whatever the hell they were in. Well, yeah, whatever was going on with any of that. He gets her to, uh, out of there because he on his monitors, he has seen that our, our thugs uh -huh. have shown up in the Chamber of Thrills finally. Yes, Chopper Slime and Dirty D, they go across this rope bridge to get into the Chamber of Thrills. It's quite thrilling, though. Uh, sure. And then Devereaux says uh, to, to someone we don't see immediately, he says, well, looks like we have Special guests? 
And then we see Sam turn around, uh-huh. except he's all blank faced. I mean, like more so than he was before. Right. And he's got some kind of robot implant. Yeah, he's a Sam bot now. Yeah. Are these robots or is he using microchips to control human beings? It's microchips because at the end of the movie, it is very easily plucked off. Hold on. When we get to the werewolves in a minute, their heads pop off and they got robot guts. Well, yeah, no, there are some straight up robots and then then there's there's sam and then the thugs who are peoples okay what have the chips on their neck all right so there's only four peoples and the rest are robots so you are either a full-on robot Uh or you are a human being with a microchip on your neck that makes you a robot slave that's more of a cyborg because that's that's mostly human but cybernetic parts i'm just trying to follow along because i didn't pay attention so we cut to the chamber of thrills where our three hex angels members have made their way and this chamber of thrills is more like a wax museum with slightly moving exhibits yeah for your amusement and horror there is a wolf man but Uh there's a dracula and a frankenstein's monster there is a mummy in a sarcophagus there's a spider that pops down from the ceiling there's a dude what just whips somebody there is somebody just getting their ass whipped yeah ah you didn't think you would see me again huh (laughs) i am back from 50 shades what if i just beat the shit out of this android Is that okay, huh, Mr. Rules? I'll whip your ass all day long, all right? I'll whip a Frankenstein. I'll whip a Marie Antoinette. I'll whip the shit out of anybody, all right? I'll do Mr. Jekyll and the Dr. Had, both of them at the same time. (laughs) Still one of our most popular episodes. Um, (laughs) Yes, yes. In this chamber of thrills, there's a mom and a dad and a daughter. And the daughter has a balloon, and they're just kind of wandering around, clearly bored. And then Chopper takes, I think, a cigarette, and he pops the little girl's balloon. It's the best part of the scene. And the dad says, hey, you can't smoke in here. And Chopper says, I'll smoke you. And I was like, is that a threat or a come on? Oh, that's definitely a threat. That's like, I, I'm going to I'm gonna murder you. I thought he was going to suck the guy's dick. When you were a kid, did you ever have an adult stranger do something shitty like that to you? Like pop a balloon or take something that belonged to you? Y- 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 yeah, but it was more like emotional damage. <laughs> I'm so sorry. (laughs) Less balloons and more my self-esteem that they exploded. Right. But all right. Yeah, kind of. When I was a kid one time, I left the Martin Four Theater with an older cousin of mine after having seen Return of the Apple Dumpling Gang. And a guy who was leaving the same theater, he was like in the crowd of people. He extinguished his cigarette on the back of my hand. Oh, shit. That is, that's tough. (laughs) I think it was an accident, but to this day, I can't be 100% sure. I hope you don't mind that. I kind of hope it wasn't. That he was just like, this fucking kid. I was like six or seven, but uh, hey, you know what? If you're the guy who put out your cigarette on a child's hand in 1979 as the Apple Dumpling Gang and Moonraker both let out of the Martin Four Theater, you know what? Send us an email. Pick six movies at gmail.com. It's never too late to make an apology. I'm here for you, buddy. More likely the lung cancer got him, but if you are listening, <laughs> just give us a jingle. Devereaux is watching our three marginally destructive biker gang participants wander around the chamber of thrills from his security post in his underground lair and then Devereaux presses a button and it opens up a trap door beneath chopper and he disappears through the floor and he slides down this tube to where i don't know we'll deal with that later and then d is like hey where's chopper and so slime is <laughs> is like hey how about we find chopper and then we can split and uh she's like yeah i can dig it slime goes to look for chopper he gets nabbed by a mummy uh-huh. and then he falls down a tube right and then the girl goes to look for both of them now she goes to the mummy and you think well maybe the mummy's gonna get her but then it doesn't right and then the spider falls and scares her and she ends up backing into an iron maiden and then that closes around her and then she falls down a tube 
This whole scene takes about six minutes. Yeah. It takes forever. It's so boring. It's such wasted time because here in a minute, we never see these characters. So fade to black because we got to go to commercial break. When we come back from the break, uh, the owner is showing up at just as Devereaux is leaving the lab. And he's like, <laughs> hey, listen, I'm about to go over to the kiss show. I don't know if you heard it was starting at eight o'clock. Uh, how about you jump in this golf cart with me and we'll put her over to the show you can see the stage it's quite exciting and i hate to bring it up but i asked you to meet me in my office about an hour ago and you never showed up remember i told you to swap out the motors and then meet me in my office it kind of hurt my feelings oh you were serious about that i thought that was another of your japes calvin i had work to do calvin thugs to capture melissa's to ignore yeah yeah yeah. how about you get in the cut listen uh abda we've worked together for a long time you know personally i have a lot of uh, well if not affection, a high degree of tolerance for you. Yes, we've worked together for a very long time, Calvin. Go on. Well, I'm afraid that you might have a few, how do I put this delicately, bats in the belfry. Oh, Calvin, you know how to flatter a person. Are you about to offer me a promotion? I'm offering you an opportunity. That's for sure, Abner. Let me guess, you're going to fully fund my program, Americans on Parade. Is that what you're going to do, Calvin? You know today's my birthday. I did know that, and uh, it is both part of the reason I'm doing it today, and also a little bit of a bummer for you. Um, no. We are not funding your Americans on Parade or whatever the hell it was. Oh, you're funding my Americans on Parade as well as my Here Come the British counterpart. Yeah, we're not doing either of those. Uh, You know how we've got Kiss playing here tonight at 8 o'clock? Yes, Kiss, with all of their horrible, horrible music, and this stage that's halfway constructed at 6 o'clock when they're playing at 8 p.m. this evening. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want you and all your shit gone by the time they take the stage. Abner. You're building me an even bigger layer? 200 feet beneath the earth? Calvin, what a wonderful birthday present. Yeah, the keys are wherever I am not. Yeah, how about you get the hell out of here, Abner? You're freaking us all out. Nobody has a good time at any of the company parties anymore. Wait a minute. Is this your way of saying that as a scientist I have somehow become what one might call mad? Yes! Calvin, I've been under extreme pressure building robots, you know, that look like classic universal monsters, all the while wondering when will the knock come at the door with a copyright infringement lawsuit? Look, you spend a lot of time on it, and honestly, the results are not great, Abner. Look, Calvin, I realize that my Frankenstein's monster looks a bit bloated, but if you fire me today, you will rue this decision for reasons that are wholly unrelated to you bringing the band Kiss to my sanctuary of family fun entertainment at affordable prices. How about I say it like this? Uh, how about you go see the world and have fun, Abda? Now I'm going to drive away in my golf cart, and you can wander around under the bleachers. Yeah, and that's what he does. He wanders off like Bill Bixby on a lonely highway at the end of an episode of The Incredible Hulk, which, by the way, premiered the same year as this movie came out. I like the fact that as he's leaving, he's just like, there's nothing out there for me, Calvin. This park is everything to me. I'm defined by my work, Calvin. If you take that away, you're taking away my soul. The thing is, Anthony Zerby is far and away the best actor in this. I think he's the only actor in this. (laughs) The only legitimate actor. Yeah. But you know that he had some, like, actor secret, like, well, you know, my my wife died at the park, and that's why I can never leave this place. Like, something that never made it into the film would have made it at least interesting. But there is n- literally no motivation to this character other than, I love robots and I hate Kiss. As he's wandering off under the Colossus roller coaster, which also debuted the same year this movie came out. That was their new big ride. It was a whole bunch of synergy going on. As Devro's wandering around, we hear over the park PA system, remember park attendees? Uh, tonight, live in concert at 8 p.m. It's the band Kiss. Come early and get a good seat. See Peter, Ace, Gene, and Paul live tonight. And... Uh, what is this? Oh, uh, 
Devereaux, the park's creator and mastermind, just was fired. So everybody, just about three seconds of silence for Abner Devereaux, who committed his life's work to building this shitty theme park. So let's give him three seconds. All right, that was enough there. But remember, kiss tonight. Kiss tonight. Kiss tonight. Devereaux, meanwhile, gets a kind of a grinchity grin uh -huh. as he hears this announcement. I just got fired. So he goes to his lab. I shall channel all of my hatred into this foursome, and I shall destroy them because they are the ones who are not even in any way directly related to me losing my job. I will destroy all of them, and Kiss will be my instrument. And then Kiss <laughs> appears from fucking space chad it it's nighttime and lightning bolts start flashing in the sky and ace freely is the first one to fly into frame and he shoots lightning bolts from his eyes and then peter chris flies in from the stars paul stanley aka star child he arrives in the night sky and he fires orange laser bullets from his eyes which creates this descending pathway for him to just walk down and then he shoots out more orange laser bullets that somehow makes Gene Simmons explode and appear and Gene Simmons starts breathing fire and then the stage just materializes in a burst of flames. It's like watching the kids turn into Power Rangers. It's fucking bonkers, man. And then Kiss plays Shout It Out Loud, uh -huh. which is kind of up there in terms of tolerability for me. We get the full song, Bo. Oh, yeah, I know. And a whole lot of footage of the parking lot from Magic Mountain. Look, we are paying Kiss to be in this thing, and we are showing Kiss. This is not the first time we will hear an entire Kiss song, nor will it be the last. No. There's a whole lot of young men and women in the crowd. At one point, they show a baby in a stroller holding a bottle. I think nearby, there's some irresponsible parents, hopefully wandering around. There's some quality necking that we get. Just some people straight up making out in the grass. That harkens me back, you know? Those are good memories. Down in Devereaux's lair, he walks over to the Sambot. And Sambot's working on this George Washington, and I think it's maybe like a Paul Revere robot. And Devereaux says... Samuel, this robot is acting all higgledy-piggledy. Fix it, Samuel! So Sam goes over and makes the George Washington robot work correctly. And then Devereaux walks over and we see that Chopper, Slime, and Dirty D are now dressed like colonists from early America. And Devereaux says, I've turned you into model Americans from misfits to my own historical inspiration! And then I don't think we ever see those characters again. No, we don't. I still am unclear as to what his motivation in this movie is. Yeah. And I don't need you to explain it to me because I think it's completely absent. <laughs> yeah. All this time, Kiss has continued to play. And so when we cut back to them, they are still playing. Yes. And then we just get a shot of Devereaux watching them play. Mm -hmm. So after all of this show. We love you, Cut Rate Theme Park audience attendees. Good night. By the way, there is an astounding collection of Paul Stanley talking to concert crowd audio where they strip out everything but him. It is fucking riotous. I can't recommend it enough. Outside a security gate, there are members of the press that are being allowed in to go interview Kiss. And Sambot is there with a camera. And somehow Devereaux can communicate with Sambot. And Devereaux says, Sambot, photograph each member of Kiss. I want images of their faces from every possible angle. Front profile, three quarter shots, close ups. Let the camera drink into their emotions. So we get a click, 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 click. And there's multiple shots of each member of KISS backstage at this concert. And by backstage, I mean over in parking lot section G4 and part of G5. After all of this photographing, Melissa breaks through and sees Sam. Sam! Sam! Don't you know me, Sam? We're gonna get married after you propose to me! I gotta get to see Sam! And he, you know, pretends not to know her like you do in that scenario because he's with KISS. He's trying to get late and doesn't need her fucking this up the kiss gene simmons from kiss takes notice of this couple having a tough time and then gene simmons says star child <laughs> 
And then Paul Stanley, who is Star Child, he fires an orange laser bullet at Melissa and the nearby security guards. And this orange eyeball laser bullet morphs into an orange star, which causes Melissa and the security guards to become slightly paralyzed for a moment. Yeah. And then Melissa just hypnotically sleepwalks over to Paul Stanley, whose eye, the one that's framed by the star, it's bright orange and it's serving as a tractor beam just pulling Melissa over towards the band Kiss. At which point Gene Simmons says, No gratitude need be voiced. Your mind speaks to us. Direct (laughs) quote from the movie. Paul Stanley says, You're looking for someone. But it's not Kiss. Heavens to Murgatroyd. And then one of the cops is like, hey, I don't know that you should be. And Paul Stanley is just like, how about you shut your mouth, cop? I'm talking to the lady. (laughs) Melissa says, it was my fiance, Sam. Well, he's technically my boyfriend, but it's only a matter of time before he becomes my fiance. Look, he was here with the camera. He was taking pictures of you. Oh, yeah. I noticed him. He's still in the park. I don't know where he is, but he's definitely in the park. And then Kiss just wanders off, leaving Melissa behind, almost as confused as the people watching this movie. Yeah, so back in the lab, Devereaux is examining all these pictures that Sam has taken and, like, drawing circles on them. It's just like, yes. Bro, he's developed them. He has developed 8x10 black and white photos of all the members of Kiss from multiple angles. Headshots and is doing a real, like, nip-tuck analysis of them. (laughs) And then we cut over to Brian James and his fellow security guard who get surprised by this ride coming to life on them. And they're like, oh, hey, geez, oh, boy, this kind of spooky here at night, you know, after all the KISS fans have left, uh, the KISS army, they're called. Does this park have electrical problems or is it haunted, Bo? It feels haunted because this happens, but you're never given any idea of like, oh, is that something Devereaux did or is it just something that happened or so they're like, you know what? how about we fucking bail and just go get coffee and they're like oh great idea as they're leaving (laughs) this like nosferatu-esque shadow appears on the wall Uh uh-huh and then robot gene simmons comes tearing through this styrofoam brick wall he's like the kool-aid man yeah except instead of oh yeah it's just ah and our security guards call for backup gene simmons just marches along and then he starts breathing fire Mm -hmm. and then two more security guards show up and gene simmons picks up one by the throat and tosses him into a trash can and then the other one he bats away like a beach ball and then gene simmons lets out this roll and then he destroys a styrofoam drink and snack kiosk yes a coke concession is destroyed by the demon but we as the audience don't know that this is robot gene simmons right you can assume that it is but you don't know that in fact it probably makes a hell of a lot more sense that a guy who can breathe fire and fly through the air is the one who crashed through a cinder block wall and destroyed this snack station as opposed to the creation of abner duvero who took pictures developed them built this robot and sent it out in a matter of what 90 minutes you're not wrong the more likely explanation is oh he is just a magical demon who has busted our place up right but after he gets away question mark wanders off exclamation point (laughs) yeah the next day the owner and the like head of security and a bunch of their pals are gathering to question kiss Uh uh-huh there's a really funny line where one of the guards is like hey maybe they're in the bath maybe that's why they haven't shown up and the chief of security goes they're not taking a bath rock and rollers (laughs) don't bathe just pretty funny but then he's like hey all right let's check the pool anyways chad this is what we were talking about they show up and kiss is in some kind of ginormous pool lawn chairs yeah they're lifeguard chairs and they're all wearing robes that you would use for human sacrifice paul stanley immediately is like hey everybody somebody's coming it's the owner even Ahoy, mates. The ownership approaches. That's right. God damn it. And then Peter Chris gets his first line of dialogue and he says, and his crew is smurfing right behind him. And I do mean smurfing. It's just the worst. And then the owner is like, hey, listen, uh, they kiss. There was some trouble in the park last night. And well, everything is pointing to that, uh, 
demon fella that you guys have in your band who I notice is not on one of your giant lawn chairs. Hard cut to Devereaux and Melissa down in the workshop layer. Yes. Where Devereaux says, what did you expect to find? Secret passages? Secret compartments? Look, your betrothed Samuel isn't a robot android who I've enslaved to do my evil bidding. Here's a secret pass that allows you access to all areas of the theme park. Be gone with you, Melissa. Farewell! Farewell! So, after she leaves, we cut back to the pool. Where we've clearly missed part of the conversation between the security guards, park ownership, and Kispo. Yeah, because Paul Stanley is is like, Gene Simmons would never hurt a fly he's a giant teddy bear even peter chris says yeah he's clean smurfy clean and then ace freely chimes in ack, ack. It, it's shocking a lot of his dialogue is him just going ack. <laughs> <laughs> it is like that is not an exaggeration he just occasionally makes this expulsion of noise that sounds like somebody stepping on a duck gene simmons shows up in his demon platform shoes and his thigh high cut gold banana hammock wrapping around his cock over this black onesie and he's got these hip hugger boots it's all fantastic and the security guard says look if you'd rather deal with the police and everybody in kiss immediately is like oh no 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 hey, 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 let's not get uh we don't have to call any police here man it's fine all right with it. let us look at it all right let, let, let us take a look band meeting we'll, we'll figure this out so, <laughs> Gene Simmons walks over and he whips his head around and looks at the security guards and lets out this lion's roar. And then he takes his place in his lifeguard chair. I like the fact that in this scene in the background, you see one of the uh, security guards has his arm in like a Boy Scout quality sling. Yeah, it's real (laughs) nice. Oh my god, this movie is so cheap. That guy's angling for some workman's cop. No one gave him this sling. This is just something he... It it might as well be his necktie. Oh, I think I hurt my arm when that giant rock and roller broke up the (laughs) coke tent. (laughs) Park owner Calvin Richards says, Hey, look, fellas, somebody busted up the park last night, and the gods think it might be you, Gene Simmons. What did all that damage? And then one of the security guards goes, Look, there's no think about it. It was him. Look at him. I don't need a lineup of five other clowns or kabuki artists or mimes to pick him out as a suspect. It was Gene Simmons from Kiss who did this. It was him. And the owner is like, Hey, 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 hey. Look, before we go pointing fingers at our super famous guests who we are counting on to do a show, how about you and I go talk over here in the corner for just a minute? And so he drags him over and Paul Stanley is just like, don't even worry about it. I could use my star power to read lips. He blasts an orange laser bullet that becomes some sort of listening device to hear the park owner, Calvin Richards, talking to the security guard where he's just like, look, they're going to bring in. $200,000 $200,000 tonight. Let them finish up the last two shows and then we'll call the cops. Yeah, and Paul Stanley translating he says, these guys are scared. He doesn't even know what he's scared of even. My favorite line was that he says, yeah, he's like, he's convinced we did it, guys. But this investigation, it's just a stroke. He just wants the security guard off his back. He's sweating the possibility that we might pull out even. He's not out for justice. He's out for just him. <laughs> Richards and the security guards, they walk back over. The park owner says, hey, look, uh, I know you rock and rollers are rowdy, but uh, look, all we need is a couple of nice shows. So uh, we're good, right? And then Gene Simmons hands Richards this yellow beach towel so that Richards can wipe the sweat off of his face. And Gene Simmons proactively says, you're welcome. Paul Stanley says, look, me and the boys decided we're going to look into this for you. Then Melissa shows up out of nowhere and they're like, oh, look, it's Melissa even. Heavens to Murgatroyd. She's back. Quick question. Has she been in the theme park all night? She's probably been up for a good 36 hours. She's probably hallucinate. Hey, Melissa, did you find your boyfriend, Sam? No, I didn't find Sam. Okay. And look, I've put down a lot of wedding deposits and they're all non-refundable. Okay. I got to get a ring on this finger before fall. And fellas, I'm thinking about telling him I'm pregnant just to move things along. 
Is that wrong? It's not. Is it? Can you just say it's right? I really need some affirmation here. And then Gene Simmons just goes, Rawr. and Paul Stanley says, must be feeding time for the demon on account of him eating annoying young women and all. We then cut to a box with satin lining and four orange cutouts resting inside it. These are the talisman that give Kiss their superpowers. One is a winged dragon. One is a cat head. One is a star with an eye in it. And the other is a lightning. Bolt. And there's this wide shot of Melissa sitting in front of the band kissed, framed distantly behind her as she oohs and ahs over their glowing amulets. And Melissa says, this is unreal. I heard about these, but I didn't think they were real. I'm like, where did she hear about this? And from who? How common knowledge is the fact that these guys possess supernatural powers afforded to them by talisman kept in a box protected by, and I quote, a cosmic force field. I assume these boxes were just full of cocaine. A hundred percent. These are Dr. Feelgood's equipment. It's got bennies and uppers and downers and yellow jackets and bumblebees and red spinners and orange whaleys and it's got everything you need to keep you going to get you up to bring you back down to smooth you out it's got all of that stuff what it doesn't have magical cosmically protected talisman no there is a pulsing sound that Melissa hears, and she says, What is that noise? And Ace Freely chimes in, <laughs> It's Beethoven's fifth. <laughs> I'm like, This dude's high. <laughs> it's Beethoven's fifth. <laughs> and, right. You know, finally someone is like, Well, that's the radiation that's killing you slowly. Yeah. Yeah, Gene Simmons chimes in. It's a cosmic force field that protects our talismans. Right. And Paul Stanley follows up. Yeah, without him, we don't even have any powers. And Melissa says, you know, guys, it's too bad that everybody doesn't have a talisman. And Paul Stanley replies, heavens to Murgatroyd, Melissa. Everybody's got a talisman. They just haven't realized it yet. Click your heels together and you'll be able to fly just like us. After you take a couple of bumps. You should try these green wheelies. All of this, it turns out, Chad, is being listened to by Devereaux because he gave Melissa that stupid pass to look around the park. Right. But really, it was a transmitter so he can see and hear everything that she's doing yeah. he kind of pets his gene simmons android that he's making in his lab and he makes it breathe fire and stuff and sam is milling around in the background and then Devereaux says soon samuel everyone will be ordinary especially the stupid kiss dude kiss is about as far from ordinary as you can get they're far beyond the weirdness that was bjork or amy winehouse or tiny tim there's nothing ordinary about the band kiss are you suggesting bjork is ordinary no i'm saying she's a weirdo just like winehouse and tiny tim i'm saying that kiss just is so far beyond that they're not normal at all and for him to be like ah kiss you're mistaken my friends you're just ordinary people with talismans full of cocaine that give you superpowers see i go the other way like i'm bjork is further on the weird scale than kiss kiss i, I mean like not movie kiss movie kiss is, is supernatural superheroes right that's what i'm talking about in the in the oh, in the okay. framework of this movie they're not normal at all oh a hundred percent not like yeah right remove the talisman and they're still space traveling warriors I don't know. We fade to commercial. And I still don't know what Devereaux's plan is here. But we do get a kiss song. How does he still have access to his workshop lair? Wasn't he fired yesterday? You take his badge. You grab him by the pants and the scruff of his shirt and throw his ass off property. You're gone, Devereaux. Hey, it was his birthday. I said, look, if you see him on the grounds tonight, maybe you just give him a mean look or two. Tomorrow he's out on his ass. To your point, we do fade back in and we get more concert footage of kiss performing the song. I Stole Your Love, which sounds terrible in this movie. The audio quality is some real bootleg cassette tape remix. It sounds like shit. This live footage makes a real good case to never see Kiss live. You do get to see Gene Simmons blowing fire in slow motion and flicking his long tongue. 
Yeah, and there's some fireworks. And I mean, it's a 70s concert. It's no better or worse, I suppose. But then we fade to black for more commercials. That is the whole sequence where it's just like, you know what? This isn't a like, hey, I got to run to the kitchen and grab some chips. Like, you can go take a whole shit for this. Like, you can relax, take your time with it, play your match three game on the John. It's fine. <laughs> you don't have to rush here. Okay. It's going to be a song. You're not going to miss anything. There's no plot being forwarded here. We fade back in and we're down in Devereaux's workshop lair where he's spray painting a wig for some reason robo sam is nearby and he's in the lair and we hear Devereaux speaking to robo sam via some remote audio connection where he says robo samuel go and find the talismans and return them to me do not stop along the way fetch them and return to sweet and so robo sam leaves and he breaks into this bungalow hotel room where kiss is staying and he kind of wrecks the place while he's doing so we see that kiss has a couch in this bungalow that it it looks like a giant snake coiled in on itself it's about six feet around in diameter and it's a good 50 feet long and but it's pretty awesome it looks great i wish i had it for my basement I, I every time i saw it because you see it a couple of times in this movie and but he really kind of wrestles with it in this scene sambot does and the whole time i was like oh that looks so much fun i, I wish <laughs> i had one of those to wrestle with myself robo sam slightly ransacks the place looking for the talismans and then the movie just slams on the brakes and we get an acoustic cover of peter chris singing the song beth but to melissa yeah, because we couldn't be bothered to change it to Melissa, I guess. And also, that's a Doobie Brothers song. The highlights of this sequence, Ace Freely looking bored as shit uh-huh. as this is going on. Got nothing to play, just staring into space. I like that Melissa just gets up and walks away halfway through. <laughs> Yeah. rude and like listen folks we're doing the whole song again it's the whole goddamn thing and melissa wanders away she sits down she thinks about some shit she gets up she moves to another place it's a long song man yeah well you cut to sam trash and kisses theme park supplied pad uh-huh and then cut back and beth is still going on yep then we go back to robo sam looking for the talismans which are safely secured under a coffee table with a towel laid over it yeah it's like that's where you hide your weed when the landlord comes over you know sam sees it opens up the box he goes for the talisman and he gets shocked by the cosmic force field so he just leaves yeah so he's just like well you know fuck this noise time to return to sambot's lair we cut back to kiss who is still singing the song beth and for a moment after the shock paul stanley appears to be incapable of playing the guitar it's kind of like when marty mcfly couldn't play as george mcfly walked away from lorraine at the enchantment under the sea dance but very quickly paul stanley recovers and continues to play the song beth yeah it, it, his level of interest in the scene is about a, a where mine is at this point fortunately we see sam bot passing by and melissa is just like a man sam it's me melissa i've got great news i'm gonna take a pregnancy test later and it's gonna be positive and we can be married next april on saturday the 12th the caterer is all set up as well as the photographer and the dj sam he just blank faced keeps moving right like he doesn't really stop at all pauses yeah. briefly to look at her and then she screams she loses her shit Bo. she starts yeah. screaming like she stumbled upon a triple suicide murder which alerts kiss do they hop to it and casually walk over hey what's going on what's all the scraping meanwhile Devereaux is like listening to all of this and peter chris notices like hey everyone somebody smurfed all our shit no look everything's moved around they smurfed it all up and they're like uh, i guess somebody was going after the talisman ack, ack. and paul stanley uh says look we can't let these talisman fall into the wrong hands even gene <laughs> simmons backs this up with ours are the only right hands uh -huh. kiss power which is kind of scary <laughs> 
We cut to Devereaux in his lair, and he can overhear all of this. And he says to himself, mm, your power cannot rival with the power that I command. And I'm like, really? Because it kind of appears to me that you're this low-rent Chuck E. Cheese knockoff creator, and you're going to do battle with this rock and roll band who have superpowers that include, but are not limited to, flight, shooting lasers out of their eyeballs, shooting electricity out of their hands, breathing fire, whatever Peter Chris's Catman powers might turn out to be. Not to mention <laughs> rocking and rolling all night long and every day. That versus your robots, it's not a fair fight, Bo. Well, he says, I may be outnumbered, but I'm not outmanned. What? I'm not clear on exactly what that threat is. You have more people than me, but I have more people than you. Well, kiss, a pity saved is a pity earned. Ah, uh-huh. I'm glue, your rubber. Whatever bounces off me sticks to you. Wait, reverse, oh, damn it. You win this round, kiss. But I'll be back. So, through some contrived logic, Kiss decides to go after Devereaux, a man that they've never met, they've never seen, they've never heard. Everything that they've heard about Devereaux has come from Melissa, who's worried about her boyfriend showing up, so either one, she can get married or maybe get all of her deposits back. Yeah, she might be insane. Like, But apparently, Paul Stanley, because he has his star magic, is able to read her heart or something, so all that right. they just know she's telling the truth. Kiss goes and super jumps over some fence to look for Devereaux. Yeah, to get back into Magic Mountain. <laughs> right. Then they are beset upon by kind of what looks like the Kilrathi from the Wing Commander movie, only... So they're robotic, animatronic, kung fu albino werewolves in silver spaceman onesies. <laughs> they look kind of like cats, too. They're albino werewolves that know kung fu. All right, fair enough. So the albino werewolves with kung fu set upon Kiss. Dude, there's a good, what, maybe 20 of these things? They're climbing all over the place. Kiss fights them in some sort of 1970s mixed martial arts where these albino space werewolves go toe-to-toe, and I guess they're being controlled by Devereaux at the controls in his evil lair. And the acrobatics of this scene are just bonk werewolves are leaping from the top of the roller coaster down to the ground ace freely tosses werewolves into the air and he punches them gene simmons flies up into the sky on these guide wires like he's peter pan as he's breathing fire it's nuts and they keep coming it's like hey these uh albino space werewolves they get in the walls and they breed at night you gotta find the queen <laughs> The Catman zaps one of the werewolves in the dick with a fireball. Paul Stanley blows some up with his eye lasers. Yeah. And the whole time, Devereaux is just like, well, this is disappointing. Who would have suspected that this rock and roll man could kill my albino karate werewolves? Well, some of the heads of the albino space werewolves pop off during the battle. And the whole thing ends with Ace Freely giving a nice ack ack. And then Paul <laughs> Stanley... <laughs> says the most truthful line of dialogue in this whole movie when he says hey this whole thing is unreal yes paul stanley it is and then they just presume at this point that Devereaux is behind all of this yeah gene simmons picks up one of the decapitated albino werewolf heads and he just says Devereaux. And Devereaux, who is watching all of this from his lair, says, Yes, let the dance begin! What is his endgame? What happens to him at the end of this movie? I mean, we'll get there, but I don't even know what that is. This is the second night of three nights where Kiss is contractually obligated to perform live concerts. They finished their second concert just a few hours ago. They gotta be worn out. And they give 100% on the stage every night. Now they gotta go beat up albino space werewolf robots? They're all amped up. They need to solve a mystery before bed. It's an old story, Chad. Life on the road. Kiss walks around the amusement park and another roller coaster goes off on its own. Kiss makes their way into this small outdoor stadium where they walk through the raised bench seating. And it looks like this place might hold like a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And then we hear a gong go off and down on the stage, a bunch of martial arts fighters show up. And then these fighters just rush up into the stands. They start beating up Kiss. Kiss starts beating them 
them up. It's pretty amazing. Well, in the most boring possible way, yeah. I mean, on paper, karate androids showing up to fight Kiss sounds great. Yeah. But it's pretty good when Peter, Chris, and Ace Freely leap into the air and then they hit the stage and then suddenly there are samurai warriors with katana swords that glow like lightsabers sometimes. Yep. Karate lightsabers. Yep. This movie ain't got Star Wars money. Then they get surrounded and we finally get a peek at the Ace Freely superpower, uh -huh. which is him doing a kind of a going my way hitchhiker motion. Yep. And then they all just disappear. Yeah. He teleports him with a ack ack and they're gone. Yeah. <laughs> Devereaux watching this is just like, oh, what? And he stares at this monitor for a solid, like, I don't know, 10 seconds. It felt like an eternity in the movie. And then he goes to Sam and he goes, well, Samuel, I guess we're going to have to enact plan A, which is the first plan that we did of you going to get the talisman. But this time, Samuel, you will have this a ray gun. <laughs> It shoots out glowing blue sine waves, and it will deactivate the force field around the box that protects the talismans that are filled with cocaine. Chad, you're a liar. He does not say that. It is not until Sambot shows up at this joint, gets the talisman, and then shoots the box that you're like, oh, that's for the force field. No, he shoots it in the lair. He blasts it across the room to show us how it works. Right, but it blows something up it's a ray gun oh okay you're right and he says if someone gets in your way use this blow the shit out of them i need those talismans and more importantly the cocaine held within as sambot leaves Devereaux says this round may be more to your liking kiss as if they have now become his mortal enemy. Yeah, they can't hear anything that he has to say either. He's no. talking to himself. So Sambot goes over, steals the box with the talismans using the ray gun. And then as he's heading back, he makes his way over to the spook house, the chamber of thrills. And Kiss sees him heading inside. And they're like, hey, let's follow Sambot. And Devereaux watches them approach and says... Well, Kiss, your ride is almost over. Because he's he's a good villain. We find ourselves back in the chamber of thrills or horrors or whatever, and Kiss shows up. Now, remember, there are all kinds of spooky animatronic robots in this place. The Frankenstein's monster and the Dracula and the mummy, and there's a werewolf. It's not a space albino werewolf, though. It's just a regular flavor werewolf. You're right, right, right. Kiss just wanders around this place until Devereaux activates his robot monster creations to attack kiss very very slowly yes the ridiculousness of this scene is difficult to capture in words uh, imagine if you heard hey kiss is going to fight a bunch of android house of horror monsters and then you gave that project to a middle school drama club Bo, i don't think any of the people playing kiss in this scene are kiss <laughs> I think it's all their stunt doubles yeah. from the end. Ace Freely is clearly a black guy in this. That's right. During this scene, Peter Chris, the cat man, he starts things off by fighting the Marquis de Sade. Gene Simmons blasts fire breath at the monsters. In Devereaux's lair, he keeps shooting the talismans with his blue laser ray gun that reduces their powers, I think. So Kiss is getting their ass kicked by the hunchback of Notre Dame and a giant spider. At one point, Peter Chris just swings on a metal chandelier with lit candles and he makes a tarzan noise yeah uh jeevan simmons sets one of them on fire why didn't he use his demon breath for that rather than using a torch on a wall well he couldn't because that was the point where Devereaux was shooting oh. his talisman what i kind of inferred from the actions of Devereaux and the ray gun and the talisman is that much like nathan drake in the uncharted games if you're not actively shooting shooting them they will slowly recharge health over time and so you have to keep shooting them so that kiss doesn't get powerful again that makes as much sense as anything else in this movie ace freely tries to teleport them out of the room with a ack ack but he can't because Devereaux keeps blasting their talismans with his cartoon ray gun they just end up across the room and they're just like hey Eck. Devereaux is back in his lair and he's laughing. Aha! It is time to bring down the curtain. Or should I say, 
bring it up. At which time, these four holes show up in the ceiling, and it sucks up the four members of Kiss into the air, which gave me pause because this Chamber of Thrills has trapdoors in the floor. There are trapdoors in the Iron Maiden, Mm -hmm. and inside that mummy sarcophagus, there are four, count them four, openings in the ceiling that can suck up a grown size adult male into these tubes that all lead to Devereaux's workshop? That's right. Uh, It's the same kind of craftsmanship we saw in much of the James Bond series. I guess. You gotta get the right guy, you know? This Devereaux, he's a real piece of work. We cut to the third concert. The crowd is getting angry. They want to see Kiss. But it turns out that Kiss is trapped behind a series of yellow laser bars in this futuristic 1970s prison cell. At which time we see four Kiss robots walk past our four imprisoned Kiss members on their way to a robot Kiss concert. That's right kiss is like hey there's no way you're ever gonna get away with this everyone's gonna know it's not us say they really got you down demon that's who must have been the one they thought was you destroying the park two nights ago mystery solved even and Devereaux enters with his remote control and he says i have it all taken care of armageddon is coming to the park tonight and all wrongs will be righted Bazzini, Tataglia, Mogreen, Stracci, Curio. Today I will settle all the family business. And I've arranged for you boys to have <laughs> a front row seat. And then Devro goes over and turns around this eight inch <laughs> monitor that's about a hundred yeah. feet away. So Kiss can watch the concert? Like, what? If they squint and kind of lean forward a little bit, they can get vague impressions of what might be happening on stage at this concert. The Kiss robots take the stage, and Melissa sees them, and she calls us. She's like, Gene, Paul, it's me, Melissa! Don't you know me? And then Melissa runs over to a security guard begging for his help, but the security guard is hypnotized, so... Is he a robot, bud? No, yeah, he's androided out. That, like uh, He has the blank stare of an android and or an accountant. The concert starts, and these KISS robots start playing. And I gotta tell you, Bo, it's pretty impressive that Devereaux created machines that can play musical instruments like this. They play a song called Rip and Destroy. To get the crowd all worked up into a frenzy. Right. Wasn't the ending of that Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey? I, yes. Didn't they have robots that played... The concert and the finale of that movie? I think probably more than once, Kiss versus the Phantom of the Park was referenced in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey's, like, creator's room. Right. The fans, though, listening to this song are starting to turn on Kiss like Ivan Drago in Rocky IV, where they're like, oh, fuck you, Kiss, this isn't Kiss. But then they kind of get into it. They right. At first they seem to be against Kiss, but then they're into Kiss, and they start chanting, they're like, rip, rip, rip and destroy. Right, and meanwhile stop 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 the steel (laughs) yeah it is it's a real january 6th scenario Uh, (laughs) kiss the real kiss is piecing together the plot of this movie which is Devereaux was planted to use doubles to incite a riot and then blame it all on antifa i mean us which is probably how the whole thing happened hey guys you know how this movie was supposed to be based on star wars and a hard day's night well what if we all come together and use the force from star wars to make the little box with our amulets filled with cocaine float over to us so we can all get high and escape this place even it is exactly what happens and it is so stupid yeah the box just floats through the air and then they get Uh, it and then they're out and then they open it up they're like boy that was easier than we thought (laughs) peter chris is like i wasn't even smurfing trying i had my fingers crossed and my eyes closed you guys are so smurfing stupid i wasn't even smurfing helping (laughs) <laughs> act act <laughs> right you know it turns out neither was ace turns out all we needed was me and you to move that box gene i wasn't even trying i was thinking about a recipe for pumpkin bread are you saying i did that all by myself oh my god you guys i'm like a scanner i might be a jedi i'll tell you what i heard a signal i gotta go pick up a little green fella teach him the ways of the force even as the crowd is, continues to get worked up. Park owner Calvin Richards says, 
hey, yo, uh, kill the power, put him into darkness. I'm sure that's what's needed to calm down a chanting angry mob. Yeah, but before they can get too riled up, this crowd, uh, Kiss flies down from space once more Yep, to land on the stage, and then it's a battle of the kisses. Yeah, the crowd's very confused. There's no music, and there's double the kisses, and they're all beating each other up. The Black Stunt Double is back fighting Ace Freely for realsies <laughs> this time, and that's pretty funny. And then very quickly, one by one, the robot kiss doubles get exploded by fireballs or orange laser eyeball bullets. I don't know what the fuck happened to the Peter Chris robot. He just disappears at a certain point, I think. <laughs> Probably shot him in the dick with electricity. Uh, things aren't looking good for peter chris but time to beat feet cheese it it's kiss so now victorious paul stanley takes the microphone in his hand and he says say are you ready to see the real kiss and the crowd goes wild and gene simmons starts singing rock and roll all night there's a great brawless tit shot for the kids in this scene which i really appreciate it like oh boy that was the 70s let's come back to the lair to wrap up our movie where melissa is there and she says mr Devereaux, sam never hurt you give him back to me and then kiss who i guess has already finished up their third concert they show up in the lair park owner calvin richards is there and he says hey girlo it's no use little lady abna Devereaux, he don't hear you no more paul stanley rips the tiny microchip off sambot's neck and he turns back into the regular old sam who doesn't want to get married to melissa uh -huh. and then park owner calvin richards says what a waste he was a true genius where ace freely lets out one more time Ack, ack. It is the most egregious moment in the movie of that of him making that god awful sound of his. No shit, everybody. Most of Ace Freely's dialogue in this movie is him just going. Ack! I think he only has two lines of dialogue in the whole film. Yeah, and both of them he's clearly high when he says it. It's bananas. And then we get the reveal of here's what's happened to Devereaux, and he's just gone white haired and catatonic. But there's no, I don't know how how that happened or when park owner calvin richard says he created kiss to destroy kiss and he lost and then he spins around this chair and it's like the finale of psycho yeah and yeah his hair's all white his eyebrows are bushy white turns out he got omega manned and then we get a close-up of Devereaux's face sort of and then we get more concert footage of kiss singing god of thunder along with stills from the movie in credits not nearly soon enough wow chad wow you know the thing about this movie is that it's boring incredibly boring yes it's boring and it's dark the pacing is slow everything about it should have worked but it doesn't yeah it's it's tragically awful <laughs> I, again i know this is something we say a lot it's one of the worst movies we've ever done uh-huh it truly is it doesn't help that i don't really like kiss very much uh -huh. But even if you did, Chad, even if you did, and I, everybody should enjoy their own things, right? Like, if you love Kiss, I'm not here to tell you you're wrong for that. But even if you do love Kiss, this is not doing you any favors. Like, even when you see him live, like we were talking about, the sound quality is shit. The movie looks like garbage. Like, I don't know what DVD you have. It, you, obviously, this is not on Blu-ray. The DVD is just a terrible transfer. And I don't know what they are... I I mean the original print may be garbage at this point who knows but even if you could get your hands on it it's a movie that dares you to look at it for a sustained period of time kiss as a band is featured in multiple other movies it's part of dazed and confused it's the heartbeat of detroit rock city which is all about a bunch of kids on their way to a kiss concert mm -hmm. i highly recommend the movie role models with paul rudd and sean william scott which has a finale that includes kiss in the most surprisingly entertaining way possible. I also think that Kiss had an important impact on so many other bands and not even, you know, things that are kind of the obvious ones like Gore or Insane Clown Posse or Marilyn Manson. But there were other bands, especially through the 90s, like Trent Reznor and Soundgarden, even Nirvana, they were all influenced by Kiss. I mean, I mentioned it earlier, a lot of those hair bands from the 80s were clearly influenced by Kiss's success and they are what they are. They're unforgettable and they are truly a major part of rock and roll history. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's unfortunate. They're iconic. And speaking of iconic bands of terrible movies, Bo, would you like to tell us about what movie is up next for episode three of this season's theme, A Flop is Born? Well, Chad, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. (laughs) And that is to dive headfirst into Spice World. We are uh, examining truly one of the great cultural phenomena of my lifetime, which is all-girl band The Spice Girls Yep, being shoehorned, truly shoehorned, into a movie that was nominated for Worst Actresses Collectively okay. at the Razzie Awards that year for all these Spice Girls. Nice. As well as Worst Film, etc. It is a famously bad movie. Movie. Can't be worse than this movie. This is worse than Spice World, but Spice World is worse than you expect. I, I expect nothing. Well, it's worse than nothing. Being alone with your thoughts for 90 minutes is far preferable to being exposed to Spice World. The Spice is life, as uh, important Harkonnens have noted, and it is uh, it is time for us to do like beast on the spice i would be lying if i said i was telling the truth but i'm not looking forward to watching that movie or talking about it but uh, if you're interested in hearing us talk about it come back in two weeks time as we discuss spice world um as episode three of the season's theme of flop is born Bo, as always any final thoughts only that uh it will be never before i watch this movie again it is, it, it's truly, truly a piece of cinematic trash that not even the filmmakers gave a shit about. It, it is a depressing thing to watch. Ack, ack! <laughs> you showed him, Star Child. <laughs> we will see you in two weeks' time. Like, rate, review. Send us an email at picksixmovies at gmail.com and we shall be back with all of the spice in all of the world in exactly 14 days. Thanks for listening, everybody.